chapter four of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay east tennessee the loyalty of andrew johnson and his energetic defense of the union in the senate of the united states called public attention with peculiar force to eastern tennessee nominally the whole state was in rebellion really nearly one-third of its people occupying about one-third of its territory remained firm in their attachment to the government by repeated public conventions by a solemn appeal to the legislature and an overwhelming popular vote the region known as east tennessee protested against the usurpation and military domination which made them against their will aliens and enemies to the constitution and flag they revered at an election held on the eighth day of june eighteen sixty one at which the people were asked to ratify the military league with the southern confederacy and the provisional constitution of the confederate states twenty-nine counties of eastern tennessee cast only fourteen thousand seven hundred and eighty votes for separation and thirty two thousand nine hundred and twenty three votes against separation still further when the rebel governor ordered an election on the first thursday in august for delegates to the rebel congress that being the day fixed by the state constitution and laws for electing representatives to the congress of the united states the union electors in the second and fourth districts cast their ballots for horace maynard and andrew j clements in such numbers estimated at ten thousand votes in the second and at two thousand votes in the fourth that they were admitted to seats as representatives in the thirty-seventh congress the people of east tennessee finding no redress in petition or ballot gave signs of a determination to liberate themselves by force of arms upon unmistakable evidence of their loyalty the lincoln government made efforts to render them all possible assistance a considerable supply of arms and ammunition was sent to lieutenant william nelson in kentucky to be forwarded to the unionists in east tennessee and another navy lieutenant s p carter was commissioned specially to organize union regiments of tennesseans willing to enlist this however was a work of no little trouble and danger transportation was extremely difficult over the long mountain route without a railroad the rebel authorities were constantly watchful of this weak point in their offensive and defensive plans from the first governor harris treated east tennessee as a hostile and conquered country and his successive letters to jefferson davis form a continuous call for additional military force to hold that region in subjection the rebel general zala coffer's earliest duty had been to overawe the union sentiment of east tennessee and protect the important railroad line connecting distant parts of the confederacy the possession of which was indispensable to its military operations despite his vigilance union arms and ammunition were smuggled in and secret combinations begun between rigorous military repression on one side and chronic union uprising on the other a desperate condition of affairs grew up still further embittered by the gradual development of a malignant persecution of bolder unionists in the civil tribunals of the state an evil of which jefferson davis himself felt obliged to take notice all summer long president lincoln heard with sympathy from andrew johnson and others the reports of the patriotism and sufferings of their people it will be remembered that in the memorandum made by him after bull run he suggested a military movement from cincinnati on east tennessee since the culmination of affairs in kentucky with the prospect of early active operations such a project had acquired a new importance 
late in september he went to the war department and made the following memorandum which though not in the form of an express order was nevertheless intended as a substantial direction of military affairs on or about the fifth of october the exact date to be determined hereafter i wish a movement made to seize and hold a point on the railroad connecting virginia and tennessee near the mountain pass called cumberland gap that point is now guarded against us by zala Coffer, with six or eight thousand rebels at barbersville kentucky say twenty-five miles from the gap towards lexington we have a force of five or six thousand under general thomas at camp dick robinson about twenty-five miles from lexington and seventy-five from zala Coffer's camp on the road between the two there is not a railroad anywhere between lexington and the point to be seized and along the whole length of which the union sentiment among the people largely predominates we have military possession of the railroad from cincinnati to lexington and from louisville to lexington and some home guards under general crittenden are on the latter line we have possession of the railroad from louisville to nashville tennessee so far as muldraft's hill about forty miles and the rebels have possession of that road all south of there at the hill we have a force of eight thousand under general sherman and about an equal force of rebels is a very short distance south under general buckner we have a large force at paducah and a smaller at fort holt both on the kentucky side with some at bird's point cairo mound city evansville and new albany all on the other side and all which with the gunboats on the river are perhaps sufficient to guard the ohio from louisville to its mouth about supplies of troops my general idea is that all from wisconsin minnesota iowa illinois missouri and kansas not now elsewhere be left to fremont all from indiana and michigan not now elsewhere be sent to anderson at louisville all from ohio needed in western virginia be sent there and any remainder be sent to mitchell at cincinnati for anderson all east of the mountains be appropriated to mcclellan and to the coast as to movements my idea is that the one for the coast and that on cumberland gap be simultaneous and that in the meantime preparation vigilant watching and the defensive only be acted upon this however not to apply to fremont's operations in northern and middle missouri that before these movements thomas and sherman shall respectively watch but not attack zollicoffer and buckner that when the coast and gap movements shall be ready sherman is merely to stand fast while all at cincinnati and all at louisville with all on the line concentrate rapidly at lexington and thence to thomas's camp joining him and the whole thence upon the gap it is for the military men to decide whether they can find a pass through the mountains at or near the gap which cannot be defended by the enemy with a greatly inferior force and what is to be done in regard to this the coast and gap movements made generals mcclellan and fremont in their respective departments will avail themselves of any advantages the diversions may present notwithstanding president lincoln's earnest interest in this project and the almost expressed order above quoted one obstacle after another arose to prevent its being carried out the special attention of general thomas was also upon it a brigade of east tennesseans was being enlisted at camp dick robinson who came there because they could not with safety be organized in their own homes under the eyes of zollicoffer from them and more especially from lieutenant carter thomas obtained such current information as made him anxious to lead an expedition through cumberland gap he several times recommended the movement asking general anderson october four for four good regiments with transportation and ammunition and adding 
i believe if i could get such a force here and be ready to march in ten days from this time that i could seize on the railroad at knoxville and cut off all communication between memphis and virginia the washington authorities meanwhile probably uninformed of general thomas's spirit and confidence designated general o m mitchell for the duty this apparent slight touched general thomas's pride and he asked to be relieved sherman however interfered informing him that mitchell was subject to his command and intimating that he thomas would not be robbed of his opportunity while the secretary of war was visiting sherman as already mentioned he also urged upon the general his personal desire that the cumberland ford and gap should be seized and the east tennessee and virginia railroad taken possession of and the artery that supplied the rebellion cut we have seen that sherman was in no mood for the enterprise that on the contrary he wanted large reinforcements for defence and though thomas once more november five earnestly suggested that with four more good regiments we could seize the railroad yet and again with my headquarters at somerset i can easily seize the most favourable time for invading east tennessee which ought to be done this winter sherman expressed his belief that they would have enough to do in kentucky and directed thomas simply to hold zollicoffer in check and await events indeed from this time forward sherman grew more and more apprehensive till at length he could scarcely endure his great responsibility our forces too small to do good and too large to sacrifice he reported on november three the future looks dark as possible he again wrote to washington november sixth it would be better if some more sanguine mind were here for i am forced to order according to my convictions sherman has himself recorded that a certain degree of public clamor had arisen about his military administration in kentucky and particularly that he was charged in unfriendly newspapers with being insane when therefore he was soon after relieved from command he attributed it to this cause this belief was altogether incorrect the fact that he had asked to be relieved and had no faith in his own ability to perform the service required with the means furnished sufficiently accounts for the change but there exists in addition positive evidence that the president was in no wise influenced by the newspaper slander upon a letter from mr guthrie indicating that the union men of kentucky were unwilling to lose general sherman's presence and services but that a question of rank stood in the way mr lincoln made the endorsement if general mcclellan thinks it proper to make buell a major-general enabling sherman to return to kentucky it would rather please me the retirement of general scott on the first of november and the elevation of mcclellan to the command of general-in-chief brought with it as usual many changes in minor commands brigadier-general d c buell previously chosen by general anderson for service in kentucky was mcclellan's intimate friend and the new general-in-chief probably needed no special inducement to give so important a duty to a favorite who was in addition an accomplished soldier his qualities as a commander were yet to be developed like mcclellan himself up to the outbreak of the war he had obtained but little rank the department of the ohio was formed on november nine and general buell assigned to its command one good quality confidence he manifested at the outset sherman he wrote still insists that i require two hundred thousand men i am quite content to try with a good many less in an interview with mcclellan before buell went to kentucky the two friends had fully discussed their respective duties and hopes mcclellan immediately began sending him reinforcements and in his first written instruction made the east tennessee movement a prime object this injunction he repeated and emphasized from time to time i am still convinced that political and strategical considerations render a prompt movement in force on eastern tennessee imperative 
the object to be gained is to cut the communication between the mississippi valley and eastern virginia to protect our union friends in tennessee and re-establish the government of the union in the eastern portion of that state i think we owe it to our union friends in eastern tennessee to protect them at all hazards first secure that then if you possess the means carry nashville if you gain and retain possession of eastern tennessee you will have won brighter laurels than any i hope to gain i tell the east tennessee men here to rest quiet that you will take care of them and will never desert them as soon as congress met president lincoln made another effort to forward the expedition which he had so much at heart his study of the subject with military men showed him that the problem of transportation was the main difficulty the east tennessee campaign would have to encounter to obviate this he proposed to congress the construction of a military railroad to cumberland gap or knoxville i deem it of importance said his annual message that the loyal regions of east tennessee and western north carolina should be connected with kentucky and other faithful parts of the union by railroad i therefore recommend as a military measure that congress provide for the construction of such road as speedily as possible kentucky no doubt will cooperate and through her legislature make the most judicious selection of a line the northern terminus must connect with some existing railroad and whether the route shall be from lexington or nicholasville to the cumberland gap or from lebanon to the tennessee line in the direction of knoxville or on some still different line can easily be determined kentucky and the general government cooperating the work can be completed in a very short time and when done it will be not only a vast present usefulness but also a valuable permanent improvement worth its cost in all the future in addition he went personally before a senate committee to explain and urge the project the subject was referred to a select committee and a bill was reported and passed to a second reading but as the committee and the senate were still in that flush of early sanguine enthusiasm which expected the rebellion to be crushed by a single vigorous campaign and especially as the army made no advance against cumberland gap but moved almost its entire strength in a different direction the subject was neglected and dropped amid the hurry of more pressing legislation it would seem that the general direction of central authority could scarcely be made stronger without descending to such details as must in war always be left to the determination of local conditions and to that judgment which an officer founds upon his personal observation apparently general buell accepted the instruction which had been given him but mcclellan quickly discovered that the reinforcements sent were not being placed with reference to east tennessee what is the reason he inquired by telegraph for concentration of troops at louisville i urge movement at once on eastern tennessee unless it is impossible here buell ought to have sent a straightforward reply either that it was impossible or that he would obey instead of this he answered evasively suggesting several alternative plans but giving no indications of a willingness to act his chief solicitude was reinforcement drill organization these were certainly useful perhaps necessary but when they interfered with the prosecution of an enterprise specifically directed by his superior he should not have left his intentions unexplained ten days more ran on and andrew johnson and horace maynard who were in washington attending congress sent buell an anxious dispatch our people are oppressed and pursued as beasts of the forest the government must come to their relief his reply kept the word of promise to the ear i assure you i recognize no more imperative duty and crave no higher honor than that of rescuing our loyal friends in tennessee whose sufferings and heroism i think i can appreciate but his letter to mcclellan of the same day if they could have seen it would have sadly chilled their hope 
i do not mean to be diverted more than is absolutely necessary from what i regard as of the first importance the organization of my forces now little better than a mob in his letter of two days later by way of making amends he said he had organized a division at lebanon with special reference to east tennessee but hinted that he would convince mcclellan it could be used to better advantage elsewhere to leave him no excuse the war department telegraphed him december twenty do you need more regiments than are now under your orders if so how many his reply indicated that he realized he was trying the patience of the government i am not willing to say that i need more regiments i can use more with decided advantage if they can be sent his more formal answer acknowledged that he had an aggregate of some seventy thousand men about fifty seven thousand for duty and his letter at length discloses the idea upon which he had been acting the plan which i propose for the troops here is one of defence on the east and of invasion on the south finally the approach of the new year together with other circumstances again brought the question so long evaded and neglected sharply to his attention johnson maynard etc are again becoming frantic mcclellan telegraphed him on december twenty ninth and have president lincoln's sympathy excited political considerations would make it advisable to get the arms and troops into eastern tennessee at a very early day you are however the best judge can you tell me about when and in what force you will be in eastern tennessee whether he intended it or not he once more sent an evasive and misleading response it startles me to think he wrote on december twenty nine how much time has elapsed since my arrival and to find myself still in louisville i have this moment received your dispatch i intend a column of twelve thousand men with three batteries for east tennessee but as i have telegraphed you it is impossible to fix a time for it to be there so much depends on the circumstances which may arise in the meantime in any event i must tell you what i have been unwilling to do all along that you will require more troops in kentucky don't acknowledge this however but act on it this last qualified promise did not long serve to postpone the decisive avowal that buell had been hitherto allowing the administration to entertain delusive hopes prompted by causes which are related elsewhere president lincoln on the fourth of january telegraphed him the definite question have arms gone forward for east tennessee please tell me the progress and condition of the movement in that direction answer in his reply buell for the first time after nearly two months of evasion fully let out the secret that his plans lay in another quarter while my preparations have had this movement constantly in view i will confess to your excellency that i have been bound to it more by my sympathy for the people of east tennessee and the anxiety with which you and the general-in-chief have desired it than by my opinion of its wisdom as an unconditional measure as earnestly as i wish to accomplish it my judgment has from the first been decidedly against it if it should render at all doubtful the success of a movement against the great power of the rebellion in the west which is mainly arrayed on the line from columbus to bowling green and can speedily be concentrated at any point of that line which is attacked singly president lincoln's comment on this extraordinary avowal is in that generous and forbearing tone which forms one of his characteristic traits but it does not conceal his sadness that the cause is to lose an advantage which a resolute commander might have grasped your dispatch of yesterday has been received and it disappoints and distresses me i have shown it to general mcclellan who says he will write you to-day i am not competent to criticize your views and therefore what i offer is in justification of myself of the two i would rather have a point on the railroad south of cumberland gap than nashville first because it cuts a great artery of the enemy's communication which nashville does not and secondly because it is in the midst of loyal people who would rally around it while nashville is not 
again i cannot see why the movement on east tennessee would not be a diversion in your favor rather than a disadvantage assuming that a movement towards nashville is the main object but my distress is that our friends in east tennessee are being hanged and driven to despair and even now i fear are thinking of taking rebel arms for the sake of personal protection in this we lose the most valuable stake we have in the south my dispatch to which yours is an answer was sent with the knowledge of senator johnson and representative maynard of east tennessee and they will be upon me to know the answer which i cannot safely show them they would despair possibly resign to go and save their families somehow or die with them i do not intend this to be an order in any sense but merely as intimated before to show you the grounds of my anxiety mcclellan did not let buell off so easily a sensitive officer would have little relish to be told that he had not only caused himself to be misunderstood but had deranged the plans of his superior i was extremely sorry wrote mcclellan the same day to learn from your telegram to the president that you had from the beginning attached little or no importance to a movement in east tennessee i had not so understood your views and it develops a radical difference between your views and my own which i deeply regret my own general plans for the prosecution of the war make the speedy occupation of east tennessee and its lines of railway matters of absolute necessity bowling green and nashville are in that connection of very secondary importance at the present moment my own advance cannot according to my present views be made until your troops are solidly established in the eastern portion of tennessee if that is not possible a complete and prejudicial change in my own plans at once becomes necessary interesting as nashville may be to the louisville interests it strikes me that its possession is of very secondary importance in comparison with the immense results that would arise from the adherence to our cause of the masses in east tennessee west north carolina south carolina north georgia and alabama results that i feel assured would ere long flow from the movement i allude to this candid lecture was within a week supplemented by another letter from the general-in-chief to buell containing a suggestion so strong as almost to amount to a positive order you have no idea of the pressure brought to bear here upon the government for a forward movement it is so strong that it seems absolutely necessary to make the advance on eastern tennessee at once i incline to this as a first step for many reasons your possession of the railroad there will surely prevent the main army in my front from being reinforced and may force johnston to detach its political effect will be very great in his answer written the same day buell at length promised to carry out the instruction as i told you in my dispatch i shall now devote myself to it contenting myself as far as bowling green is concerned with holding it in check and concealing my design as long as possible but though he in the same letter acknowledged that the numerical strength of his command had risen to ninety thousand men he could not bring himself to act even in fulfilment of his own definite promise nearly three weeks later he wrote a letter alleging that the want of transportation and the condition of the roads had thwarted the programme to a long argument in support of this opinion he added for the reasons i have stated i have been forced reluctantly to the conviction that an advance into east tennessee is impracticable at this time on any scale which will be sufficient the real reason of his conviction appears in a few sentences which follow and which show a final decision to carry out his long-cherished design of a movement in force against bowling green if there be a question among military experts as to the momentary feasibility or local value 
of this east tennessee movement there can be none when considered in its influence and relation to the whole great theatre of war a glance at the map and a study of attendant circumstances can leave no doubt that it was entirely possible to have seized and held the mountain region of eastern tennessee and that such an occupation would have been a severance of the rebel confederacy almost as complete and damaging to its military strength as the opening of the mississippi if also there had been any doubt about the earnestness of the union sentiment of the people of eastern tennessee events soon developed ample proofs of their patriotism and devotion to the government the reader will remember the transmittal of arms and ammunition by nelson and carter and the formation of secret military organizations by the bolder unionists rumors and promises of the coming of a union army also reached them from time to time in such form as to excite their hope and measurably inspire their reliance had general thomas been permitted to march his column to cumberland gap and knoxville as he desired about the first of november his presence would have been favored by extraordinary events startling news reached the rebel secretary of war on the ninth of november two large bridges telegraphed a railroad president on my road were burned last night about twelve o'clock also one bridge on the east tennessee and georgia railroad at the same time and an effort made to burn the largest bridge on my road there is great excitement along the whole line of road and evidence that the union party are organizing and preparing to destroy or take possession of the whole line from bristol to chattanooga two days later the commanding officer at knoxville wrote further details my fears expressed to you by letters and dispatches of the fourth and fifth instance have been realized by the destruction of no less than five railroad bridges two on the east tennessee and virginia road one on the east tennessee and georgia road and two on the western and atlantic road the indications were apparent to me but i was powerless to avert it the whole country is now in a state of rebellion a thousand men are within six miles of strawberry plains bridge and an attack is contemplated to-morrow an attack was made on watauga yesterday our men succeeded in beating them off but they are gathering in larger force and may renew it in a day or two they are not yet fully organized and have no subsistence to enable them to hold out long i learned from two gentlemen just arrived that another camp is being formed about ten miles from here in sevier county and already three hundred are in camp they are being reinforced from blunt roan johnson green carter and other counties i need not say that great alarm is felt by the few southern men civil war has broken out at length in east tennessee said another letter in the late election scarcely a so-called union man voted they looked confidently for the re-establishment of the federal authority in the south with as much confidence as the jews look for the coming of the messiah and i feel quite sure when i assert it that no event or circumstance can change or modify their hopes in this state of affairs this part and indeed all of east tennessee will be subjected during the war to apprehensions of internal revolt more or less remote as the tide of war turns in this direction the recent bridge burning in this section was occasioned by the hope that the federal troops would be here in a few days from kentucky to second their efforts there are now camped in and about elizabethtown in carter county some one thousand two hundred or one thousand five hundred men armed with a motley assortment of guns in open defiance of the confederate states of america and who are awaiting a movement of the federal troops from kentucky to march forward and take possession of the railroad these men are gathered up from three or five counties in this region and comprise the hostile union element of this section and never will be appeased conciliated or quieted in a southern confederacy to these appeals from persons of local prominence governor harris of tennessee added his earnest entreaty the burning of railroad bridges in east tennessee shows a deep-seated spirit of rebellion in that section union men are organizing this rebellion must be crushed out instantly the leaders arrested and summarily punished the richmond authorities were not slow to respond two regiments from memphis and another from pensacola were ordered to east tennessee in all haste with such miscellaneous companies and fragments as could be gathered up nearer the scene of disturbance 
troops are now moving to east tennessee to crush the traitors telegraphed the rebel secretary of war you shall be amply protected there is little need to relate the quick and unsparing movements by the confederate troops against the union combinations the uprising seems to have been ill-advised and ill-concerted unsupported as it was by federal forces the hasty gatherings of the loyalists were quickly dispersed and many of the participants captured the course of the richmond government towards the east tennessee traders however deserves to be remembered in the eyes of jefferson davis treason to the union was a holy duty while treason to their usurpation was deserving of exemplary punishment which in this instance was ordered with apparent relish i am very glad telegraphed the confederate secretary of war to hear of the action of the military authorities and hope to hear they have hung every bridge burner at the end of the burned bridge to the officer in charge of the prisoners he gave specific instructions first all such as can be identified as having been engaged in bridge burning are to be tried summarily by drumhead court-martial and if found guilty executed on the spot by hanging it would be well to leave their bodies hanging in the vicinity of the burned bridges second all such as have not been so engaged are to be treated as prisoners of war and sent with an armed guard to tuscaloosa alabama there to be kept imprisoned at the depot selected by the government for prisoners of war p s judge patterson colonel pickens and other ringleaders of the same class must be sent at once to tuscaloosa to jail as prisoners of war under these stimulating orders which were distinctly approved by jefferson davis the military commanders executed their task with a zeal which seems to have outrun all discretion a veritable reign of terror ensued several bridge burners were hung with impressive publicity the jails were filled with accused persons and carloads of the more notable suspects were shipped to the military prison at tuscaloosa when the civil laws and judicial process were invoked to ward off in some measure this wholesale proscription the commanding officer placed the city of knoxville under martial law until such time as all the prisoners charged with military offences now in my custody can be tried by a military tribunal persecution so ran riot that one of the subordinate confederate officers at last felt obliged to protest against it i have just been appointed commandant of this post knoxville and have already discovered numberless abuses that should be corrected marauding bands of armed men go through the country representing themselves to be the authorized agents of the state or confederate government they impress into service horses and men they plunder the helpless and especially the quondam supporters of johnson maynard and brownlow they force men to enlist by the representation that otherwise they will be incarcerated at tuscaloosa they force the people to feed and care for themselves and horses without compensation i would gladly have instructions as to the mode of correcting these abuses and the character of punishment to be inflicted upon those guilty of such offences a feeble response of moderation came from richmond in relation to the abuses mentioned the secretary expects you to be vigilant and energetic in suppressing them but the officer was further directed to look for particular instructions to another of his superiors whose severity was also notorious in the case of the most conspicuous of the union ringleaders the confederate government narrowly escaped the odium of what would have been a signal injustice and breach of faith which its overzealous partisans were eager to perpetuate local rebel vindictiveness centred itself against the editor of the knoxville whig the well-known parson william g brownlow who had opposed and denounced secession and rebellion in his journal and elsewhere in bitter and unstinted language when the uprising took place he was naturally suspected of having been its chief instigator and though he disavowed all knowledge of the bridge burning and publicly opposed and condemned local insurrection his enemies adhered to their belief in his guilt and on numerous occasions threatened him with personal violence he appealed for protection to one of the confederate commanders and promised to leave the country if he could have safeguard in his exit upon assurance that this would be done he surrendered himself to the military authorities but was immediately arrested for treason on a civil writ it must be recorded to the credit of secretary benjamin that he resisted the importunate clamors for brownlow's trial and punishment and kept the honor of the confederate government by finally ordering him to be conveyed under military protection within the union lines
End of chapter 4